Yep. No problem. And I'm going to share my screen. Just got to make sure that I can see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Know Your Numbers, which is a, I think, number three in our series of webinars, uh, help explaining the basics of business finance to clients and prospects alike. My name is Stuart Newbury, and I will be taking you through this today's webinar. Uh, for those who don't know Zoom, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little chat button so you can operate a chat. If you've got any questions arising through the session, I will be answering those at the end. So if you'd like to put those in the Q&A box, um, I'll also open it up for people to actually ask questions. Uh, if for every, any reason you need to stop me or say, something really important, you can raise a hand. Um, I may not see that. I, I, I have noticed I've, I've failed to see the raised hand a couple of times previously, so I apologize in advance for that. So my, as I said, my name's Stuart Newbury at Positive Practice, and on the screen are my contact details. So you can contact me after the webinar if you'd like to discuss anything that has come up. What well, for this session? The budget is not just a collection of numbers, it's the expression of our values and aspirations. Jack Lou. Um, this is a, a comment that I, I see a lot. People don't understand why they need to put a budget together. Um, people can usually see, understand and recognize the need for a plan, uh, but they don't always look at the budget in the same way. Uh, and as you'll see as going through here, there are some key pieces of administration that businesses should do, and a budget is one of those. Uh, this webinar is about just defining the most common reports that you'll see weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually, and so that you can control your business performance. The agenda for today is why you need to know your numbers obvious one of course, uh, overview of the reports that are critical, the difference between profit and cash, the key drivers of business value, protecting your assets, adopting best practice, the next steps and questions. If you need to take notes, please note I can supply copies of all the slides and I will also be providing you with a little workbook at the end of the session via email. Um, I've tried to take as much account ease out of this. That is the foreign language that us accountants speak uh, in our native tongue, uh, out of this presentation as much as possible. But there will be some terms that I cannot avoid. Um, as always, any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Why you need to know your numbers? Firstly, they tell a story of your business, allowing you to interpret the results of your business activity. This helps you identify the systems versus the root causes. For example, a declining gross profit is a symptom of many root causes, such as ineffective pricing, having to rework work, or poor purchasing, or just wastage. Knowing your numbers will enable you to spot early warning signs of potential issues. For example, monitoring... Sorry, just got someone coming in. Monitoring how long it takes for customers to pay you to allow you to quickly respond to that number as it starts to increase. Areas of strength and weakness will also be highlighted. For example, your balance sheet may indicate whether your business value is going up or down. Understanding your numbers also means that you have a reliable financial information to base your decisions on. And finally, knowledge is power. 
the more know, you know about your business, the better you are at managing that business. Uh, knowledge is power is my old school motto. Uh, and I actually think it's false. It's the application of knowledge is power. So just understanding your numbers and reading them is great. Actually doing something about those numbers to change while your business is operating is the true power. Overview of the key reports. Key reports that we'll be looking at today are trading accounts, profit and loss statements, balance sheet, statement of chargeable, changes in equity, depreciation schedules, and the director's current account. Naturally, if you're not an incorporated business, the last one is not appropriate for your business and you will usually have owner's equity accounts. Trading accounts. Your trading accounts track the sales and variable costs and gross profit. Gross profit indicates whether your margins are improving or deteriorating. You can track the results across different divisions and product lines by multi using multiple traded accounts. So, so you may find that if you've got different sources of income, you might want to split out the trading accounts to reflect those sources and the associated costs. Small adjustments to the item in your trading accounts can have a huge impact on your overall business, which I'll demonstrate now. As you can see from, from this example set of accounts, the sales are 1 million and 17,000 pounds, just over 17,000 uh, pounds. Opening stock is 56.8,000 pounds. Purchases are 326,000 pounds. Closing stock is 65,000 pounds, which gives us 318,762 pounds. Total cost of sales. We then have a number of direct costs, which result in a gross profit of 248,749 pounds, sorry, uh, which is 25% gross margin on that million pounds. These are those numbers I highlighted, I just read out. These are the key numbers that we'll be talking about in a second. So if we adjust the sale by 10%, it has a major impact on what can happen. So 10% increase in sales gives us another 100,000 pounds of sales, which takes us to nearly 100,000, 1,120,000 pounds almost. A reduction of 5% in our cost of sales has a £15,938 effect on the total cost of sales. But the actual total effect of all of those is it changes that 24% gross profit to 35%. We've only changed something by 10% in one direction, 5% in two other directions. That's a 35% improvement in profit. So it has a massive change. Of course, some of these may be smaller changes, but you, they're, they are multiplied. So a 10% change there, plus minus 5% change there, are actually multiplied together. So a cumulative change, not an additive change. So it's not a 10% minus 5% minus 5, which if you do the addition will be zero. It's actually changed it it's quite significantly. It's given us an 11% increase in gross profit, which actually works out to be almost 20, well, 48% increase in our gross profit on the initial 24%. So this is why those numbers become important. Small changes to these trading accounts have a massive effect. Profit 
Profit and loss account track, up, tracks overall performance of the business, matches the income and expenditures for a given business, given period, and provides a framework to benchmark results and fundamentally drives business value. Those of you who regularly talk to me, you will see these accounts are very similar to the type we produce. Uh, clearly, there are health and safety costs in there. There are costs that may not be specific to your own business, but these expenses are your fixed costs. These don't change with respect to your number of sales. So your accountancy fee will remain the same if you're sales double. Your staff level will change, not directly, with your sales figure. Um, legal fees, motor, motor running expenses, may vary if, you, if you're providing vehicles to your staff, but if you're not, they'll stay the same, even if your sales go up or down. Hence why some of these are fixed costs. Clearly, wages if you employ more people go up, so will pension contributions, but if you're renting the same property, it doesn't matter if you double your sales or half your sales, the rent still needs to be paid at the same level. So these are fixed costs and these, these are effect. Uh, the numbers that were brought forward from the last slide, so £248,000 worth of gross profit. If you look at the total fixed costs of £362,000 of fixed costs, we're actually now making for this trading business a loss. So what was a healthy £1.1 million turnover still results in a loss. So gross profit and sales are not the be all and end all of any business. It's actually net profit at the end of the day and cash that you have. Again, if we change some of these by five, minus 5%, five so we're reducing insurance by 5% and we're induced, reducing the rent by 5%, we have kind of a significant change on some of these numbers. I, this system jokingly increases the accountancy fees. Not even I would double the accountancy fees that much. <laughs> I'm not that clever. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'd get away with it. Uh, but you can see significant changes can result in large numbers so we're now to we're now actually making things change positively for you so this is that new improved cost and we'll check that those five percent and ten percent changes of earlier we've now brought them through and we're actually making a profit again we've only changed the maximum of the sales by ten percent and reduced other things by five percent and we've changed that massive loss into a, a good profit Balance sheet measures the net worth of the business at, the, at a point in time. Shows if the business is solvent. Comparisons between periods are possible, so you can look at previous years. Useful for tracking strength of the business. Again, that's down to the solvency, what cash, flow, what cash it's holding and what assets it holds. And it's the basis of key financial ratios, which I can go into. So the balance sheet is built up of the equity, the assets, and the liabilities. Assets are things like cash in hand or a bank, money that you owe or owed, potentially goodwill that you built up in the business, and potentially assets. So property, plant machinery, fixed assets. These all have a value. Liabilities potentially are cash you owe, so there may be overdraft, maybe a revolving credit account. It could be money you owe to your suppliers. Um, also, could be money you owe to the VAT man or tax man. Uh, any employee entitlements, which are wages due but not yet paid, directors loan accounts or any money owed to the business owner, the money that they put into the start of the business, uh, finance leases, etc. 
commitments of that sort. Non-current assets are usually the loans and other financial arrangements. So currently we're talking about non-current assets being things like bounce back loans. That's the common one we're seeing at the moment. Uh, it's called a balance sheet because assets and liabilities, in theory, should balance themselves out. If they don't, we either have a surplus of assets or a surplus of liability. A surplus of, of liability means that you owe more than you are actually worth. And that can, can lead to insolvency. Again, and we're just highlighting those key total assets, total liabilities and assets. Those are the key measures on this. Debtors days, so debtor days are the amount owed divided by the sales. So 365 days in the year, we know that the debtors are currently on this account, 72,000 pounds, just over. Divide that by the total sales, times it by 65, and debtor days means it basically takes this business 26 days to get paid for a sale. Some of you, of course, you're not selling stock, you're not selling goods, you're selling services, but if you're still not getting your invoices paid, you still have debtor days. Improvement of five days in, in that. So if you improve that by five days, that will bring in just short of 14,000 pounds cash into your business. That's the sales divided by 365 times five, in this case, gives you 40,000. So if you could reduce that debtor days by five days to bring it down to 21 days, that's the equivalent of bringing in just short of 14,000 pounds into your business immediately. Inventory days, again, for those of us who sell, sell services isn't appropriate, but if you have stock, this is basically measuring the cost of stock and how long it takes you to recover the cost of that stock that you hold. So inventory or stock divided by the cost of sales. Inventory is there, cost of sales is on here, we just looked at. Uh, divided by 65, so 365 gives us 74 days. So for this business, it takes from them buying new stock to actually getting the money back into the business from the sale of that purchase of stock, 74 days. Again, reduce that by a small amount, nine days. And that actually brings in 7,860 pounds back into the business. So again, small changes in these days, debtor days or inventory days, can actually bring cash back into the business quite quickly. And if you added those two together, you got £22,000. Trying to sell an extra £22,000 is quite hard, but you've got that cash sat there, basically in, in your business. There are dozens and dozens of ratios that you can play with on the balance sheet. Those two are the key ones that for most manufacturing businesses they would use. Um, I can go and look at each individual business that we work with and produce some key ratios that are appropriate to them. And if you would like to talk about that, we can do at some future point. Statement changes of equity. One of the items on our balance sheet was the money owed. So this shows if profits are paid out in dividends or are retained by the business. Captures the value of the business, less assets, less liabilities, and show if the co co company is solvent. And this is just based on that last slide. So the equity, opening balance, so this is what the company was worth last year. We've got profits for the period, increases, decreases, so we've got losses. 
read this example of lot losses and if there's any pay, dividend paid. Clearly, if we've got a loss there and we're adding another loss to it, we've got a larger loss. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, so that's where this number came from. This number here comes from here, brought forward from 19 and 119,000 pounds of opening balance for 2020 with a loss for 2020 of 113,000 gives us a total loss of 350, 305,000 pounds. So you can see where that has come from. Director's current account. Um, this is a running record of funds introduced and taken by the business from the business by the directors. So some businesses, when they have transferred from sole traders or partnerships to a new company, will be will sell their goodwill, their assets to the new limited company. The owner of the business may take that as a credit to a director's loan account, and that is available to be taken out of the business when the new limited company have funds available to them going forward. Um, it's also a way of monitoring personal expenditure that is made by the, from the business. A number of businesses each year present accounts to me where there are expenses that are clearly not business related. And we just credit those that are not business related to the director's loan account as an expense on the director's loan account. They are not allowable for tax purposes and we have to account for where that money has gone. Um, it ensures a record of different balances for each director is maintained. If there's just one director, it's fairly straightforward, but you can imagine a situation where there are multiple directors and they may have introduced funds or capital into the business at different times and taken out monies from those director's loan account at different times. The director's loan accounts is a way of maintaining those balances so that everybody knows that they're only taking out their fair share of money from the business. Um, it shows what is owed to each director by the business, or if it's overdrawn, how much the shareholder owns a business. A simple example, opening balance from 2019 was £29,474. Funds introduced during the year was another £2,078. But monies were also being repaired of £8,003. The business paid some personal expenses during the year. So the, the actual difference at the end of the day is £9,679 being re effectively repaid to this director. So at the end of the year, instead of £29,474 being owed by the company to the director, the new balance is £21,873. Of course, if more money had been introduced, that figure would be different and it would increase. Um, very rarely do we see now director's loan accounts at zero, uh, especially after the last couple of years where people have been drawing salaries, but not the business hasn't been able to fund those salary draws. A director's entitled to that money, just the business couldn't afford to pay it. So that's being credited to the director's loan account. So when the business is more fluid in cash terms, that director can take those wages at a later date without any more tax being implied because he's already paid it at time of payment in terms of salary. Again, just going through what I just explained, those nice steps. Fixed asset register. This records all fixed assets. So fixed assets are anything that is not used up by the business. So jokingly say, if you buy paper for your printer, 
that's used up. The printer itself is usually sat there on a the desk or on a cupboard. It is an asset that the business owns. If it wanted to, it could sell that for a return. Probably wouldn't be as valuable as you paid for it, but you would actually have some value in that fixed asset. Clearly a vehicle is far more valuable than a bit of planet equipment sometimes, and the vehicles clearly retain value until you scrap them. So they have there. Um, facilities are spread, the, it's facilities spread the cost of the asset over its useful life. So computers are the easiest ones to describe. If you spend a thousand pounds on a computer, the convention is that a computer has a useful life of three years. After three years, most computers are out of date and have a zero value. So we write off that asset over three years, rather than in the first year, you, it's on your account as an asset for three years. It helps you keep a record of those assets. It's a useful guide to see how much you should be putting aside to replace those assets going forward. Uh, and also, if you looking to sell the business, the assets may be something that the new buyer wants to buy, particularly if you're a manufacturer and they're looking at the machinery that you use to manufacture. They'll want to buy those assets. They've got a, they've got a value. So it's, when you're selling a, a manufacturing business, it's not necessarily just the goodwill, it's the assets that they are buying. Having an accurate valuation of those and the true worth to the business is important in those situations. Here's a typical asset register. So we have everything from vans, cars, software, computers, iPads, computer printers, website. People don't realize that your website is actually a asset. It generates income for you. It's, it's there, it's got, it's like goodwill, it's got a value. And machinery, so you've got everything on this one from the signage through to ovens, generators. I'm assuming this is based on the food manufacturing plant because it's got kitchen equipment and all the rest, uh, bin washers, all of these. As you can see, the cost of these can be quite expensive. Opening NBV, uh, I did talk and say I wouldn't use too much counties. Uh, net book value. This is how much it is worth in the account. So in any one year, a van may have cost you £22,000 initially, but as you'll know, if you drive off the forecourt, instantly loses some value. The net book value is the value at that time. So this is for 2022, the opening val net book value. And we have same for all of those, as I said, some computer equipment, maybe hardly there at all because it's it's gone over three years and the, the value has dropped is it almost nothing. And in this case, you know, useful website, if you spent eight and a half thousand pound on building your website, two or three years time, you'd have to spend it again because it's probably out of date. That's why this reflects a zero. Some of the actual equipment don't drop as fast. And we could talk about uh, depreciation rates, et cetera. Um, again, we record, as I just said, you record the purchase and, and asset and disposal of any assets. Oops. Trying to get my mouse to do this slowly. Um, so the typical rate and method uh, you've got something called RBA, which is reducing balance. Uh, and none of these have got, in this example, I've got SB, which is uh, SLB, which is straight line balance. Um, so reducing balance is fairly easy to explain. If you buy something for £7,826, in this case, a car, and it's got a 30% depreciation rate on reducing balance. After the first year, the car is valued at 70% of the initial value. The second year, it's 
and then valued at 70% of that 70%. So it reduces exponentially at 33%, at 30% on a reducing balance. The math says it will never get to zero because a third of a penny is one third of a penny, which leaves seven cents if you were in dollars, etc. So it's that um, straight line is the other method, and it's usually used for things like, as I said before, computers. The simple reason it, you say it's got a finite life of three years, so you know each year it drops down by 33%, end of three years, the value is zero. That's a straight line depreciation. You know it will go to zero at some point. And you can have different variations. So you see plant and machinery, 15%, reducing balance 10%. So the signage has got effectively useful life of 10 years because it's got 10% reducing balance. Uh, 16 years for the freezer room uh, because of the percentages. Uh, the trays, according to that, it would have a um, less than 18 month reducing balance, useful life for baking trays. So that, that's what, where they come in. Uh, depreciation is based on those rates. And what we do is then depreciate. So the take the car as the example. The initial cost was £7,826. First year it was reduced to £5,870 of the third reducing balance. The second year, which is the current year where we're talking about, that is then reduced by a third, which gives you £1,761, which means that the new book, net book value on, and in, in normally I would say closing net book value, will be £4,109. So that's the two accumulative depreciations, difference between that one and that one equals that, that plus that equals the 7,000. So you're quite easy to calculate it. And that works. So that you will see on page eight of most accounts I produce, the asset register. Difference between profit and cash. This is the one that most people uh, are confused by. Turnover is vanity. Profit is sanity, cash flow is reality. You can have a million pound turnover and still lose money. You can have profits in the account. Great. But if you haven't been paid by the club customer yet, even though you've actually technically got the profit, you know, that's, that's not a good situation. The cash in your bank is reality, and that's the key, king. Cash is king, as they used to say. So profit and cash, VAT. This is where, to demonstrate where things go. I'll just move that, because it's just in front of me. Uh, sorry, I'm, I've got things on my screen. So to demonstrate the difference between profit and cash, consider the items. VAT affects your cash balance, not your profits. Loan repayments affect your cash balance, not your profits. Interest on loan affects both. Asset purchases only affect your cash. Asset sales affect your cash. Depreciation, which we just talked about in the last slide, affects your profits. As you can see, even if a business achieves an healthy profit, there may be not any cash available because they've got these other things that are not affecting their profits, which are drawing on their cash. These are items affect your cash, but not your profits. The business cycle is another useful way of demonstrating the difference between profit and cash. 
owners invest in their business usually generate in assets that are used to generate the income so this could be a buying a license it could be buying a right to trade it could be paying a subscription could be buying plant and equipment generate income new loan finances enters into the assets as well that then generates profits which are return on your assets those gains so profit gains sales growth margin growth the drains are unchecked overhead expenses as you saw earlier overhead expenses can take a net pro a gross profit into a net loss and that generates cash from your business activities which can be then repay back to your owners so that's the business cycle the drains on cash are slow collection of debtors remember we talked earlier about the Changes in debtors day, bringing in extra cash, uh, increasing stock and, and work in progress. Again, if you reduce your work in progress time or your stock days, you can generate cash. If you don't, it drains cash out of your business. Business loan repayments, business tax repayments, and faster payment of suppliers all drain your cash. Gains, so Jen, how to gear. Faster collection of debts are going to bring in cash, decreasing your work and stock, as previously said, brings in cash, paying your suppliers slowly actually generates cash and reducing your tax bill definitely generates cash. Of course, the owners want to take cash taken out of the business and they will get their personal loans repaid by the business. You accelerate the cycle to return your return on investment. So the faster you go through this cycle, the quicker your return on investment. So the faster you generate assets that generate profits, that generate cash, the quicker the, re the owner gets their return on investment repaid. Um, key drivers of your business. Um, after cash flow, business value is the next most important measure of your business success. Part of knowing the numbers is understanding measuring the drivers of your of the business value. These drivers might be monthly recurring revenue, monthly growth, revenue per client. These are not necessarily values that are on your account, but they will be important numbers for your business. To be honest, every business has their own key drivers, and these are usually termed key performance indicators or key profit indicators. Um, it could be that it's the number of leads generated. If, you, if your income is generated from new business, clearly the number of new businesses that you, new business you set, sign up clearly generates more new business, generates more cash. It could be recurring business. It could be um, net book value for the clients you've got. Depending on your business, there will be some measures that are key to, to your success. We can work with you to identify those drivers to help you increase the value of your business going forward. Um, the little dashboard there is if you looked at if you looked at our internal meeting this morning, we have a dashboard which has little drivers and little dashboard. It tells us what our sales figure are for the month, what our expenses have been today, what profit we're making, how many leads we have, how many new businesses are we talking to that may not have signed up, but we're still talking to them. How many clients pay us by direct debit? So we have our own key performance indicators. And I would suggest that in addition to your account, you develop some key matrix that you measure on a monthly or weekly basis that indicates the health of your business. 
enhancing your business value, implementing a clear plan. It's vital that you have a plan. Um, one of these phrases that I, or sayings that you used to really love was, failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, as a business owner, if you don't have a plan, you don't know where you're going, you don't know if you've succeeded and you don't know if it's good, your business is going to deliver the lifestyle that you want for you, for you and your family. Having a clear plan is essential. Depending on the size of your business, having a clearly documented structure and roles for each position in your business is also key. You know who's on the bus and what they are doing so that they can help you achieve that plan. Um, I've added this next one simply because we are encouraging all of our clients to think about cloud-based real-time reporting. Um, I still get carrier bags full of papers. I still get spreadsheets. I still get people who bring their work in nine months after the year end and say, how well is my business doing? It's quite hard to say, well, nine months ago, you were doing this. Problem is some of that information is actually 21 months old because it's nine months plus 12 months because it's run over that. So me telling you how your business did 21 months ago is pretty useless. The analogy I use is you don't drive your car just looking in your rear view mirror. You shouldn't be driving your business looking just at the past. You need to be looking at the windscreen in front of you, the dashboard in front of you that's telling you your speed. And if you're really clever, the sat nav tells you where to go. You develop those tools for your business, you will get far more success. Um, review your documentation systems and processes. Important to have processes for every job for the simple reason it makes it repeatable and your business can run without you. Um, I am finding my business runs better now we've got more processes in place because people can apply those and it's not just me. So I'm encouraging clients to do the same. Reducing the reliance on the owner. It also identifies your key risks so you can manage them. So if you know that one of your key risks is everything goes through one person, you have a documented system that then says, how can reduce that risk? So if that person's off sick or leaves a business, your, your business doesn't fail. You've got a way around that. Protecting your assets. Li limitation of liability. Um, if you've got a limited company, you are protecting your personal liability by having that company trade. As long as you trade legally, uh, your personal assets are not in danger if the business is liquidated. In that sense, you should really consider who your directors are and the company and what assets are held personally by the directors. Hence the directorship. Security of loans provided. At the moment, uh, there are a number of loan support schemes. But if you are currently seeking a loan, even one supported by the government, 80% of the banks will start asking for a personal guarantee from the director. You need to consider that because that is you putting your money at risk if you can't repay that. Ownership, op ownership options for high value assets. You may want to consider, you know, if the business owns commercial premises, consider moving that into separate ownership from the trading limited company. So that, that, that high value asset doesn't fall if the trading company falls. Um, 
most of our clients know that our cone office is actually owned by my pension. So the business doesn't own that. It's actually owned separately, so you're protected by if anything happened to the, to the trading company and vice versa. Uh, terms and trade and credit policy. It's important if you are trading that you have well-structured terms of trade and credit policies. Um, I get involved quite often in people saying, I've got this bad debt and I cannot collect it. And then when we look, they've actually got really poorly written terms of trade with low calls in, which basically means sometimes the debts are uncollectible. It's usually useful to get those sorted. Insurances, are, it's number six. Most people, when I talk about protecting assets, they think of insurance first. It's number six, it's on layer. It's important, but it can't protect you against everything. Um, but you should insure for those things that are foreseeable and will impact on your business. Um, financial planning, having a financial plan as well as a business plan. Understanding what your needs are in terms of the business is critical. And finally, estate planning. For most of us who, who actually own our business, um, having powers of attorney and clear path of transferring the business's assets from the current owners to the next generation, etc., is vital. Without powers of attorney, you can have your business for, fail simply because it can't manage the bank account. It has no one who's, who's directing the trade, trade going forward. Even if it's just to, to sell it to someone, you still need that power of attorney in place. Adopting best practices. I said earlier, the um, Knowing your numbers is important, but three essential tools that I think all businesses need. Annual business plan, know where you're going. If you know where you're going, you're more likely to get there. If you don't know where you're going, you don't know if you've ever, ever got there. Um, annual forecast, just an idea of what your, what your plan is in terms of the monetary side how much you're going to spend, how much you need to make to pay the bills and what those likelihoods are. Ongoing reporting accountability. Regular report and see how you're doing against those plans and forecasts. If you are mon only monitoring your accounts once a year, you're looking in that rear view mirror. If you're looking at it every month, you're at least looking at the dashboard and see how fast you're going. Knowing your numbers is just the beginning. Next steps. I would suggest that you write down, if you've not already done, three actions or projects that, you, that will add value to your business. A problem or an opportunity. Sorry, a problem is an opportunity to create a project. So if you can see a problem with any of the things that we've talked about so far, it gives you an opportunity to improve. Doing nothing should not be an option. Action is necessary. As I said before, knowledge is power, is the old saying. It's actually the application of that knowledge, doing something with it, that is the true power. You can read every book going, but if you apply nothing, nothing changes. Let's set the weight of the books on the, on the shelf. That increases. How we can help. Sorry, this is a bit of a salesy bit. Um, we can help you with business planning. Our planning is not just a 35 page business plan. It's actually a process that works out over 90 days to help you grow your business. That currently for our clients is costing 350 pounds. Uh, 
we can help do a cash flow pro forecast, uh, which is a minimum of the next three months projection. And we can extend that to a year to look at where the cash is going. That's important if you are finding that cash is an issue. Planning and forecasting the cash gives you the ability to manage it. Um, we offer coaching for financial coaching from £100 a month. Um, and we can help generate manager reports, be their financial or KPI reports, on a, on a quarterly basis for £160 a quarter. Uh, anybody wants to talk to you about that, you know our numbers. If you just want to talk about what we've talked about today and get a better idea of how you might be able to apply it, we offer a free complimentary meeting to all our clients to do that so that you can understand how it could help you run your business. Now, hopefully questions. Now, this is where I've got to somehow find the question box and see if I can find if anybody's put any questions. Can't see any. Might be, it's easy to unmute people. Have, has anybody got any questions? Matt? I don't have anything, Stuart. No, I don't have anything at this moment. I think when you send the workbook out, I'll have yep. a review. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the homework's always going to raise all the questions. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. Thank you. Phil? No, nothing from me. This, this for me, was purely informative. Oh, I wanted to get well, kind of a, a grounding in the language and the kind of the flow of the whole thing. That's fine, Phil. That, that's part, part, of the problem, part of the problem that we're trying to address is getting people to understand what they don't know so that they can ask intelligent questions. So exactly. that's, that's fine. Um, as I don't think you were on when we first started at the beginning. We are taping the, or we're recording the actual session, so it will be available on YouTube, so you can listen to it all over again in case you've missed anything. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So I'd like to thank you for your attendance today. As I said, we'll send out a link to the recording at the end of probably tomorrow, because it just takes us a little bit of time to get it uploaded. Um, again, thank you very much. And as always, you've got my contact details. If you need any questions answering, please let me know. Thank you.